Awesome. Welcome everyone back to the main room. I hope everyone had a great time meeting some other folks on the call and getting a chance to talk about some issues with natural gas, natural gas messaging. Um, we'll have a chance to return to these discussions uh, once we get to the Q&A part of uh, after Caleb's presentation. We'll invite folks to talk about some of the examples they've discussed in their breakout rooms and share some of their own experiences with um, natural gas, fracked gas messaging, and the kind of insidious talking points of the industry. But with that, I'm going to pass it to Caleb, who's going to take us away uh, with this presentation, which I'm very excited for. Just a quick reminder for all y'all folks to remain muted during the presentation. Feel free to drop questions in the chat as we're going along, and we'll try to get them to the Q&A. When we do get to the Q&A at the end, I'll ask folks to raise their hand to come off and ask questions, or if you're unable to, you can just drop your question in the chat and I'll catch it and read it out to um, Caleb to answer. But with that, I'm gonna pass it to Caleb. All right, thanks so much, Kevin. And uh, thanks all for being here. Uh, my name is Caleb Herringa. I am the campaign director of Gas Leaks. And uh, we are about, I'm gonna get my slideshow to work here. Can folks see my screen? Great. Yep. Me and awesome. Great. Well, uh, yeah, my name is Caleb Herringa. Uh, you see him, his pronouns. I'm based in Seattle, Washington, and I'm the campaign director of uh, Gas Leaks. And uh, just real quick background about me. I was with the Sierra Club uh, doing press and communications work for about six years or so originally on coal and then kind of moved into the gas sphere towards the end as well. And um, about six months ago, uh, was, you know, this project was starting up called Gas Leaks. And uh, there was really a need amongst some of the folks working in the climate space for a really branded uh, anti-gas campaign. Um, there's obviously you know, a lot of work going on around this, but there's just so much work to do amongst the general public in terms of changing understanding about natural gas. And uh, the folks here probably know all too well that when you talk to people about these issues, sometimes natural gas is still somehow seen as the, like, uh, the nice fossil fuel. Uh, the one that's not so bad compared to coal or oil or something like that. And uh, we all know, uh, working on this, that that's not true, that there's uh, uh, quite a bit few downsides to gas and uh, ways that it's harming folks. So um, our goal really is to, you know, raise awareness about that um, and also, you know, challenge the, the industry a little bit, uh, both in paid and earned media. Um, we're never going to be able to go dollar for dollar with the fossil fuel industry, um, but we do know that because we have a really powerful message, and you know, when folks are confronted with the realities about gas, that they they do uh, tend to uh, can be moved on it. And I'm going to show you some of the, the reasons we believe that here in a little bit. Um, Thus far, we're about six months into this, it's been very exciting, and um, we do have a website which hopefully folks have had the opportunity to, uh, to check out. I'll send around some of this uh, material afterwards as well. Uh, but we're making, you know, little social media videos, infographics, and blogs, and that sort of thing to really explain the reasons why gas is not natural or clean or or even affordable anymore. And um, really trying to, to, to get at that and, and prove the concept too, that when people are confronted with this information, they, they can change their minds. So we launched our first big ad campaign in August, September of this year um, in Arizona and Nevada, reached about 8.5 million people with it. And uh, it also included some message testing, which I'll show you a little bit here uh, in a little bit, um, that did show some pretty significant shifts in people's opinion about gas afterwards. And um, we are sort of looking at the next phases of this. We've uh, talked about rolling it out in other states and are, are you know, actively looking for funding opportunities to, um, to really expand the, the reach of this information. So super exciting. And hiring executive director, which we're also super excited about. Um, this has been sort of a, you know, we're going from a project to, an, to a real organization pretty soon, which is exciting. So um, what do we know from polling about gas? And so some of this may be, uh, you know, old information to folks who have been in the work for a little bit, but uh, for, it's worth restating and just grounding ourselves a little bit. Um, when you take the general public and you ask, you know, about natural gas, almost half of them will say that it's clean energy, which uh, really speaks to the immense amount of decades of advertising and that kind of thing that the industry has been doing. Um, but 
you know, when you ask them about methane gas, they don't like that quite as much, which can be really um, frustrating for those of us working in this work because we all know that it's all the same thing. Um, and the one of the big takeaways early on that we've always pushed is, you know, call, you need to call it what it is in terms of the, the, the product and it's not natural. Um, it's methane. And um, we tend to use methane gas at gas leaks, and we can get into some of the reasons why for that. Uh, there's been some polling that suggested that you know, frac gas actually activates some of the Republican and right-leaning folks on, you know, makes them like it more, that kind of thing. We do also believe that there's a lot of news coverage these days about methane, uh, you know, methane in the atmosphere, that kind of thing. And uh, the more you can remind folks that there's a very real connection between the stuff in their house and the, the stuff that's heating up the, the planet, uh, there's some value there. But I've also heard some very convincing arguments for saying frack gas, and particularly for folks who are living in areas where there's a lot of fracking going on. That makes a lot of sense. Um, the one messaging tidbit, though, that I do try to tell folks is um, you do need to meet people where they are. Um, most people know it as natural gas. We can't necessarily change that. We have some kind of you know uh, wordplay things we try to play around with that and say there's nothing natural about natural gas. You'll see us use you know, square quotes around natural quite a bit. Um, it, it helps people identify what it is we're talking about, but it also makes them feel like they're in on some secret about it not being natural. And it's a good good opening to kind of talk about some of the, the, the problems with gas. So, um, and in terms of demographics, you know, Climate Nexus has done a, a, a good amount of polling over the years on, on some of this. I'm, I'm sure some of you folks have seen some of that in the past as well. Um, you know, left-leaning women are a, a big demographic that we know can move and change their minds on a lot of these issues. Um, younger folks also tend to, you know, be more with us uh, typically, but also can be, be moved on it as well and be activated to action as well, particularly around the climate message. Um, we've also seen some polling that suggests that Black and Latino uh, respondents and audiences are receptive to the idea that methane is, is a climate threat. Uh, which is worth keeping in mind. And the flip side to that is, you know, men and white men and Republicans, it's been, it's a lot, uh, you're swimming in upstream a little bit to really change hearts and minds. Doesn't necessarily mean you wouldn't do that in certain circumstances, but um, it's an uphill battle sometimes. So I'll show you our uh, ad here. This is kind of a two minute or so clip uh, that we played um, in Arizona, Nevada. And uh, hopefully I can make this full screen. Sliding. You know that dishonest, manipulative thing where one person tries to confuse another person by making them doubt and question reality? Turns out it's not just for toxic relationships anymore because we have been officially gaslit by natural gas. You know the thing you heat your home and cook with? Natural gas is anything but natural. It's actually methane, a poisonous, toxic fossil fuel that puts our communities, climate, and children at risk. But the fat cats who profit off methane gas have denied that reality for years, telling us it's safe, affordable, and oh so clean. Heck, they even use logos like this to try and sell it. Look at those leaves. So green, so earthy, like it's a spa treatment or something. The thing is, it's all just a marketing trick used to disguise the fact that methane gas is explosive, unhealthy, and destroying the earth. And on top of all of that, it's burning a hole in our wallets. Methane gas has tripled in cost in just the last year, making everything more expensive from heating our homes to cooking. So if you can't afford to heat and eat, you might want to cut back on cooking because stoves leak methane gas even when they're turned off. And some of the chemicals in that nasty gassy have been linked to cancer, cardiovascular disease, and childhood asthma. Just another reality those gaseous execs fail to fill us in on. But hey, look on the bright side. At least your wheezing kids and mounting medical bills will be a nice distraction from the fact that methane gas is a big cause of global warming, which makes it worse for the climate than coal. You know that dark sooty fuel also known as Santa's worst present? Yep, methane gas is worse than that. <laughs> And it's the leading cause of this stuff. So despite all the gaslighting, the fact is methane gas isn't good for your wallet, your health, or the earth. It's not natural. 
and it isn't going to give you a facial. We have been lied to, pure and simple. It's about time we did something about it. To learn more, go to gasleaks.org. All right. Expectation right here. Oh. Look at the full screen again. Okay. Um. Sorry about that. Um, so, so afterwards, uh, you know, in addition to having these ads uh, and before we started them, we did some message testing. We essentially took folks from uh, these uh, counties that we were going to be advertising in, um, left-leaning women in those areas, and um, you know, had had polled them on how do you feel about gas? Uh, is it clean? Yada yada yada, and. Um, the results of this were were pretty remarkable. We we showed them um, you know thirty second cuts of of the, of the ads, and these are the versions that were served to them as ads in in, in the wild, and uh, you know broken down by health and then cost and safety and climate. And um, when w the results of this came back, uh, the climate nexus folks who, who who did it like had to double check to make sure that they didn't make a mistake because <laughs> it was it was really remarkable that uh, people's opinions shift pretty remarkably um the percent of folks who say you know is gas clean uh dropped by 30 plus percent um when we asked folks you know does do gas stoves have a negative impact on health we saw similar like almost 30 percent uh shifts in, in opinion on that um, not huge differences in the various different messages, which was something we were we were hoping to find, but um, but didn't really come out. But the the takeaway was that all the messages did well, which was amazing on its own account. Uh, we asked about you know do you support local governments phasing out the use of gas in new construction? Um, not quite as drastic as a change there. I think we ran into people's general uh, you know, feelings about government and regulation and that kind of thing when you get into the policy a little bit, but still significant changes. Um, this was super interesting. We uh, Southwest Gas was the gas utility that um, uh, is, serves these areas. And uh, we did not bring up Southwest Gas in any of the uh, ads themselves. Uh, but even aside from that, people, you know, the favorability about their local gas utility dropped pretty precipitously after this, which is pretty amazing to me. Uh, you didn't even have to bring up um, who the company was. Um, the results were, were pretty remarkable once we actually had them out in, in the wild. Um, you know, we reached 8.5 million people uh, viewed over 23 million times. Um, this is a little bit getting into the, the you know, the, data metrics and such, but you'll see the video completion rate at the bottom there of 38%. Um, that was the one thing our ads folks were super excited about was, you know, folks actually stopped and watched the ads more than your average ad, which is really, really, I think speaks, you know, the, the quality of the creative we're really proud of, but also speaks to the, the power of the message. This is a a message that people had not been confronted with before and where enough people were interested to sit and choose to watch ads, which is pretty remarkable to me. I don't sit and watch ads. <laughs> so um, uh, really, really, uh, really good news for us there. Um, we did, you know, there was not huge differences in the message testing about like whether different specific messages worked more than others. Uh, as a comms related person, we're always, I'm always searching for like that perfect message that will move the, the audience perfectly. Um, we didn't really get much there, but the one key takeaway that was interesting was that we got a remarkable, a more engagement on the, the cost message. Um, and that kind of surprised me a little bit, um, was not, you know, typically we're fighting against the perception that gas is is cheap. Uh, it has been for for decades, as many folks know, thanks to well, not thanks to fracking, but because of fracking. Uh, and that's changing, though. Everything we've gone through in the last year has seen you know prices triple. Uh, you know, the wholesale price of gas tripled this year. Um, that's not necessarily being felt uh, right now, but it is starting to trickle into people's energy bills in a really really significant way. 
So uh, people were really interested in that idea that um, that gas isn't cheap and that we it's not affordable. Um, and we did take, have some takeaways about you know using shorter shorter clips on YouTube and um, different kinds of formats where we can get to things. Um, we could talk more about that later, but uh, the other thing that we're doing at Gas Leaks is uh, we really wanted to create content that could be used everywhere, that could be used all around the country, whether you are uh, working in your city to you know, try to pass all electric building ordinances, uh, whether you're fighting fracking wells in your community, whether it's pipelines, uh, all that stuff. We wanted to make evergreen content that um, different organizations, different individuals around the country could, could take and, and, and send around their, their networks. So um, I'll show you a, a, a few of these videos um, and uh, just to give you a sense of kind of So that was one of our first films we were very excited about. Um, folks, I'm sure have seen some of the news coverage about uh, you know, gas in the home and, and gas stoves. That's something that we've consistently found in the social media we do that people people respond to, people people click quite a bit. Um, that's you know certainly getting at a, a, a types of people that are worried about different things. Maybe they're not climate activists, but they are concerned about their kids' health, that kind of thing. Uh, this was another one we did, and I'll, it's a quicker one. I'll show you real quick. Do you pay a gas bill every month? You should know you may be paying for lobbying by the fossil fuel industry. Gas utilities funnel millions of dollars every year into the American Gas Association, which works behind the scenes to keep Americans hooked to so-called natural gas, preventing cities from moving to cleaner, safer electric appliances. You shouldn't be forced to pay for lobbyists every time you pay your bills. It's time for federal regulators to stop letting gas utilities funnel your money to the American Gas Association and its fossil fuel lobbyists. Visit gasleaks.org for more information. And uh, you know that's another thing that we're really hoping to do with gas leaks is uh, put a bit of pressure on on the industry. Um, you know, folks, where general public, if you ask them about, you know, Peabody Coal or you know, Exxon or you know any of the big fossil fuel uh, corporations, they they generally don't like them. But somehow, the, you know, your local gas utility is, is seen as different, and we really want to challenge that. Right? You know, the fo a fossil fuel is a fossil fuel is a fossil fuel, and if we're ever going to get to the clean energy future we deserve, um, it all has to go away. So um, really focusing on industry um, uh, and the industry's role, both in, in lobbying is, is a big, big goal here. Um, this was another one that came out uh, just a month or so ago that we're really happy with. A normal day at school, math, recess, and fossil fuel company indoctrination. Gas companies are distributing materials to our schools and skewing the narrative to get kids on board with so-called natural gas. The gas industry is using dinosaurs, imaginary friends, and pizza 
to make kids feel warm and fuzzy about gas. What they don't mention is that gas is a huge threat to kids' lungs, safety, and their chances of having a stable climate in the future. Visit gasleaks.org to learn the truth about the gas industry's misinformation. And that's, uh, uh, hopefully folks have seen some of the news coverage of this as well. Uh, there's been some numerous examples around the country of you know, the uh, gas utilities putting together little booklets and sending them around to schools where ostensibly under the name of safety, you know, because gas explodes, they're also including stuff about you know, how it's nice and cuddly and clean and that kind of thing. So um, really wanting to, uh, to, to get the message out about that. And um, you know, the, uh, the, there is some parallels here between what in the way the natural gas industry has acted and the way the tobacco industry has acted in terms of you know, changing kids' minds very early on and making their products seem approachable. And then uh, this is one that uh, came out real recently. Oops. Um, Folks, as I, you know, as I mentioned, the, uh, the price of gas is, has kind of gone through the roof this year. Um, inflation is obviously at the top of everyone's mind. Um, and we really want to and are starting now to do a bunch more on this topic and um, also connecting it to all of the fights around the country that are going on at the local level to increase access to energy. Um, folks here probably know that you know it's pretty unconscionable the amount of people who lose access to to their electricity because they, they can't pay for it right now. Um, and uh, this is a you know this shows up as a slider post to have all the images here, but if you're on Instagram or something like that, you can scroll through all these messages at once and links to a blog that um, explains some of the issue a bit there as well. But um, it re really does, uh, you know, connect this this issue to, um, to to broader justice issues and energy access issues. So, and uh, these are boring to look at, but I also did want to include uh, some links to some of the blogs that we've put together, um, and especially the one at the top. I don't know, you know, folks around the country have probably seen that gas utilities are really trying hard to look like they're part of the the solution. Uh, you know, renewable natural gas is the new buzzword, which is you know biogas captured from uh, landfills and uh, sewage treatment plants and uh, you know commercial commercial dairies and agricultural areas, and um, they're piping in little bits of that into their system and then saying, well, we captured some methane and so we're we're green now, um, but we can you can see pretty clearly when you look at the data that there is not. Um, any real way that could scale up to, to displace any of the frat gas and just is really expensive and not a real solution. What we really need to be doing is moving towards clean electricity and uh, the, that and hydrogen too are both being used as sort of um, uh, false solutions that will, will slow to that transition. So we've got some really good uh, uh, information there on, on the website. Um, as well as uh, pipeline replacement programs. I'm really happy with that. There was a, um, there's these programs around the country where uh, folks, you know, cities or states will put up basically a blank check to the gas utility to cover the cost of replacing pipelines and then pass that on to gas customers. Uh, but they've done monitoring around the gas system after that happens and not found any improvement in the methane leaking from, from, from pipelines. So. Um, it, it goes to the, um, the fact that this is good money being thrown after bad at a, at a fossil fuel system and we really want to want to attack that. So, so uh, that's kind of the, the end of the presentation here. Um, the other things I wanted to mention in terms of uh, products that will be coming soon that could be helpful for folks. Uh, this is super wonky, but folks may know what uh, I've heard of a line extension allowance. Um, gas utilities around the country, essentially, there's, they, they uh, charge their customers extra money and then use that money to hook up new buildings to the gas system. And it essentially operates as a backdoor subsidy for just continued expansion, even though we know we need to be moving away from this you know, leaky, dangerous system. 
Uh, and uh, we're going to have an animated kind of real straightforward explainer of what that is and why people should be angered by it. Um, and that's coming in the next few weeks, which we're super excited about. Um, also hoping to do some more stuff about hydrogen. Uh, you know, the people, gas utilities are blending hydrogen into their systems and claiming it's greener, but there's a whole lot of problems with that as well. And um, also looking at some of the false advertising. If folks probably have seen garbage trucks in our communities that have these, you know, written on the side, clean burning natural gas or renewable natural gas. And um, I think we, we think there's a pretty significant argument to be made that um, that's false advertising on some level. Very few of those trucks are actually operating on renewable natural gas. It's primarily frac gas usually. Um, so trying to look forward to doing some work on that later this year. So keep an eye out. And um, happy to happy to take questions. I, I'd also be curious to hear from folks, uh, you know, as they broke out of their 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 small groups, um, what what you're hearing, you know, what, in terms of misinformation or misconceptions about gas, uh, what, what's what's hardest to change people's minds about, and and how do you go about trying to do that? I'd love to have a discussion on that those lines. Um, I see Bob is raising his hand um, and, and folks, yeah, well, being go ahead and come off mute and ask your question and folks feel free to raise your hands using the raise your hand function uh, on Zoom or if you're unable to do so to drop a note in the chat that you want to ask a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I'm with uh, Beaver County Marcellus Awareness uh, Community and for over 10 years, uh, we've been uh, exposing that the Marcellus shell is a uranium find. And that's where the radon gas comes from, up out of the ground, goes through the coal, goes through the drinking water and vents out of the ground. But all of your natural gas now is radioactive. And the New York Times ran a full week story on Pennsylvania and the gas wells. And I believe that was one of the things that got New York to outlaw fracking and uh, the dumping of the radioactivity. We've been trying for 10 years to try to get that subject moving that this radioactive uh, material is nuking us uh, and, and everyone just turns their head. Oh, well, we're gonna become millionaires because we just signed a lease. The landman convinced them that they were gonna get rich. So they keep their mouth shut. But we're really frustrated. How do we get this topic of the radioactive uh, longevity uh, out into the public and you know get the rubber on the road about this? And they also in Pennsylvania was putting the frac waste water on the roads, selling it to the state, saying that it will melt the snow and it'll keep the dust down on the dirt roads. Well, that all came to an end. That they found out that that's not a good idea. So, you know, you're not only nuking everybody, but uh, how do you clean up nuclear waste? I think these are some subjects that are, are really at the top of the list and no one wants to talk about them. Yeah, um, I'll just respond real quick. Uh, the the, the folks probably saw there was a study out of Boston that, that where they looked at you know just measuring around gas uh, stoves and you know found elevated levels of benzene and cancer causing agents there. Um, I know that California there should be a study coming out there soon that shows really similar things there super elevated levels of cancer causing um, of agents. Um, the and yeah I mean the the. You know, would not surprise me at all if there's a radioactive uh, materials coming out of there. So part of um, part of I, what our hope was with gas leaks is is to draw is to draw connections between you know the the cradle to grave of, of gas. You know the I, I really liked um, one of the I believe it was the Physicians for Social Responsibility report that said home is where the pipeline ends. Uh, it's, I think it's a really good visual for folks that um, that you know th this is toxic stuff that's being pumped right into your into your home. So, um, and I think there's a, there's a still immense amount of work to do there, and we're we're excited to do more of it. 
Caleb, I wanted to add one other thing. We use a lot of gas here in the Northeast. And if you have a gas furnace, you have to have it out, go out a chimney. If you have a gas hot water tank, you have to have a pipe going outside. But if you have a gas stove with an oven on it, you may have a vent going outside, some recirc, but most people don't have anything. So, so what's the difference when you turn on all four burners in the oven when you're cooking a Thanksgiving dinner? Absolutely. Um, Maury Johnson has her hand raised. Um, uh, I just, uh, you talk about the radioactivity. Yuri Gorby, a uh, professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, I think. He's uh, been He's been making presentations for this for a long time, and he is the, one of the professors that met with New York State, who um, uh, convinced them that uh, the gas was not a good thing. So check out his, uh, I put a, one of his uh, uh, articles in the, in the chat, but Yuri Gorby is a really, I've, I got, gotten to meet him once. He's a friend of a friend. He's really a very intelligent man and, and has some great studies on this. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we also have a, a question from the chat that I think is an interesting one to bring up since it wasn't kind of covered in the materials you shared so far, Caleb, but it's about the argument of natural gas is necessary for baseload. You might also extend that to a lot of the modeling on climate response um, usually accounts for natural gas replacing coal. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to see if, if you all have thought about what to do in terms of that kind of messaging. Um, it's a little bit of a wonkier kind of area, but I wonder if you guys have done anything on that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is, uh, I'm not gonna say it's our Achilles heel, but it's an, an area where the, there's, 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 a, there's right now there's a legitimate you know, correct argument there that we need baseload energy and uh, gas, unfortunately, is doing a lot of that. Um, I, I will say that, you know, batteries and pumped hydro storage and that kind of thing is being um, is being looked at more and developed more geothermal. Uh, I think folks have mentioned as well. So there are technological solutions out there. Um, I think that the way I looked at that at that question, if I get it from reporters or, or anyone is like, sure, you know, the, right now, unfortunately, we, we do need some gas for, for baseload, but the industry is expanding at breakneck speed. We, we don't need brand new gas plants for that are gonna be with us for 30 years, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, we, we, we need clean energy solutions and the, the technology is, is starting to come along. And I think kind of spinning that question back to the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the rate of expansion of the gas industry, they're, they're expanding at a breakneck speed and we need to stop and slow this down and think about it more has been my response. Well, thank you. Uh, Pat also has her hand raised. This may be a pretty simple question. Um, I get my gas through the energy co-op here in Philadelphia that supposedly gets it from underneath the landfills and it's supposed to be clean. But I was thinking that the gas company here just has pipes that go out throughout the whole city. How in the heck do I get special gas just for my home if I pay for it through the energy co-op? It must just go into a gas system that has regular fossil fuels, right? It just gets mixed in. I'm not getting anything special, am I? Uh, yeah, I, uh, maybe Kevin has some thoughts, but my, my understanding is in almost every situation, they, they charge a little bit extra and the, the that money goes to, you know, some credit that a utility in some other state oftentimes will add just a tiny bit of, of, of biogas into the system. But uh, when you look at the scale of, you know, convention, quote unquote, conventional frac gas uh, versus biogas, biogas is just a drop in the bucket and it's, it's not a real solution. So I think you, it's probably worth digging into and asking more questions about for sure. Yeah, I think all the biogas that could be produced theoretically would make up only a small percentage of energy use. And there's other problems with, you know, the quote unquote natural biogas and burning forest area and things like that so 
Um, so if I'm still getting regular gas, fossil fuel gas, instead of the, the good stuff, um, do I then need to get some kind of a gas monitor in my apartment? Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the biogas is, is methane and, and methane works chemically the same way in your home, regardless of where it came from. It's still an explosion threat and it still has health uh, co concerns. So, uh, okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I think, Jim, you also had your hand, hand raised. Yes. Uh, I just had a question. I, I believe. Uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry in America still um, receives significant subsidies um, that are paid for you know, by our taxes. And I've, my understanding is it could be as much as $20 billion a year. And I just wonder if anyone has ever figured in the economics of those types of subsidies um, in what we pay for a uh, our natural gas or pay for our, our gasoline, not to mention all the externalities that are occurring with climate change um, that we all are going to be paying for one way or the other with increased in, in uh, insurance uh, costs. I just wondered uh, uh, if, if that's ever been you know, taken into consideration when people think that they're getting such a deal um, you know, uh, with uh, using fossil fuels. Um, so that's my question. Yeah, um, I, I don't have the, the stats off the top of my head, but I've, I've, read, I've read reports in that as well. You know, the, the oil and gas companies can write off exploration costs and all sorts of the costs of extraction uh, that, that you, you know, is the sure it looks cheap when you when you when you get it on your bill but uh, you're, you're paying for it somehow and yeah i i will say we, we want to do more on on the subsidy issue because i i do think it's a way to um open up folks to that you know may not really believe in climate change or or have any or are skeptical about the health concerns but you know the idea that you're paying extra for it in the back end um doesn't seem fair to a lot of folks that may otherwise not be with you. So, um, Dorothy has an interesting question in the chat. She was wondering if it's possible if there's a possibility to use some of your content to encourage folks to take change uh, to change out their appliances with the funding that will be available through the Inflation Reduction Act. In other words, connect the kind of two up. Yeah, that's a super. It's a really good idea, and it's something we are grappling with. Uh, you know, the best way to to do that, to make really consumer facing content um, that lets folks know what this, what the tax benefits are and subsidies are, because there are a whole bunch in the IRA. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a goal of ours for, for, for next year is, is more content uh, along those lines. I think it does kind of vary sometimes from state to state too. Some states have extra, uh, extra benefits. And there are, um, I would point you to RMI, uh, who does a lot of work on the implementation of, of that. And I think they've got some pretty good explainers there. They, they, they are good explainers. They tend to be, I feel like more wonky than like they're useful for someone like me who works in, in this space. But for, I think if there was a way to connect with short videos um, that would encourage people to visit, we're toying with the idea of something called an energy navigator who can help people look at their homes and figure out what to apply for or what they might qualify for once the implementation comes down. And so I could imagine a space where, you know, at a neighborhood association meeting or at an organizational meeting, showing some of those short videos about why they should look into opportunities for changing out appliances um, might be more eye catching and get them to act more than just an explainer that we could put together or that we could get from RMI. So. I hope you'll you'll keep thinking about that. Uh, 
also note, um, Jan has a good comment in the chat about a good portion of gas being shipped overseas, which goes back to Caleb's answer to the previous question about, you know, base load and need for natural gas. If you get those encounter those arguments about you need natural gas as a base load, which I know is a term that's kind of going out of style now, people talk about flex power, but um, the <laughs> rapid pace of the expansion of gas does not match any sort of need that may, may or may not exist in that respect. So that's a good point, Jan. And then George has his hand raised. You could and ask your question, George. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I tossed this in the chat, but it hadn't gotten picked up yet. I was, what's the nature of the toxicity from a gas range? Is it coming from uh, uh, leaks or from the combustion products? Yeah, it's a really good question. And again, I wish I had this the, the breakdown and stats on the top, tip of my tongue but um you know that the, the industry will say when you challenge them on this that like any pollution is just from the combustion of food in, in your in your pan and, and there is some you know real air quality impacts of that but even that independently you know they've found that gas stoves gas stoves leak methane when they're off you know the, the levels of leakage that um that happen even when they're off are, are, are pretty shocking um, and so, and you know, methane. You you add methane in particular into an enclosed space, um, even regardless of what you're cooking, uh, it, it's a problem. So uh, it's a, it's a both and situation, and the industry sometimes tries to make it look like it's just a food cooking issue, but it's not. I think nitrogen nitrogen dioxide right is one of the main components that gets released. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it's bad. Um, Linda, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, I put a link in the chat. Um, Rockus is an organization I work with reducing outdoor contaminants in indoor spaces. But bottom line is you've got to address indoor sources, not just outdoor. So we, we developed a guidance document on kitchen range hoods and reducing emissions from cooking. So there's a lot of good information in there. If you're installing a range hood, if you want to make your range hood more effective, if you want to reduce emissions from cooking. Um, but we just recently developed a bibliography on induction. Obviously, cooking with induction can, uh, can and, and you can just get a two burner stovetop unit and avoid use, using your gas burners. Because that doesn't deal with leaking methane, you know, stuff leaking when the gas is off, but still gives you a chance to try it out and uh, make some progress. So check out that resource and share it with others. Cool, thank you, Linda. Um, Caleb, one question I have for you, it would be um, if you were to give advice to someone who's currently campaigning against a uh, fracking well, gas infrastructure pipeline, or even better regulations of, you know, that, that would lead to transitioning away from gas and homes, what is your kind of main messaging advice you would give to someone in the, when they're crafting their own narratives and writing their emails and their petitions and things like that. Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one um, because it, some of this is a little dependent on whether you're talking to you know elected official or uh, you know the member of the general public. Uh, I would say that, and this is easier said than done, but you know personal stories. Uh, the age old, you know, narrative uh, tip is that personal stories and heart, hearts move more than, than minds. Uh, you can, you can throw stats at people as much as you'd like, but um, it's a, it, 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 people are much more likely to respond to stories of people and, and the impacts that they're feeling from, from gas. Uh, so wh when at all possible, if you can find that in your community, um, those are always the, the they go a lot further. Things would be a lot simpler if you could just give people stats and change their mind, but unfortunately, people don't tend to work that way. <laughs> yeah, no, I know that makes a lot of sense. Um, I also want to highlight Barb uh, has a question in the chat. Um, are you aware of the plan launched by Toby Rice, the CEO of EQT, to target millennials to become fans of fracked gas? Um, it's calling them the Shillennial generation, and she's wondering if you're ads are simply in your ads are simply targeting kind of the millennial generation um or the generation after them i guess would also be pertinent yeah i, I thank you i did see some articles on that just recently and i think that's something we'll we'll look into producing some content about um 
Uh, and we've seen pretty similar things, you know, the gas industry, some with some targeted campaigns and ads to communities of color as well. Uh, you know, really trying to get into the democratic base. It, they they even say that that they're trying to to do that and and really make people soft on the on the issue of gas. So um, yeah, that's that's in general. I think a lot of our content we're trying to make real approachable to to younger folks and millennials. Um, but I also would say that I think the industry is um, it shows how scared they are <laughs> that they're that they're doing this. That they, they know that young folks aren't are trending away from their product and the fact that they're they're sinking this much time and effort into trying to change that I think speaks to how much how weak they are. Yeah, definitely. And I think we've all seen some of the stories about influence, influencers being paid to talk about how great it is to cook with natural gas stoves and things like that. So definite pushback. Um, so we're about uh, out of time. I think we have time for one more question if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Otherwise, we'll move on to talking about how we can stay connected. Cool, great. Um, I'm going to do a quick screen share. Um, huge thanks to Caleb for that presentation. That was awesome and highly informative. Uh, I just wanted to give folks a reminder that you can keep the conversation going by joining the Halt the Harm Network. We've set up a special space to talk about the dangers of gas. And I'm going to drop a link to signing up to it right now into the chat. So you hopefully has copy and pasted there. Um, I encourage everyone to create a profile and then you can stay in touch with any of the folks you met on the call today, especially during introductions. I'm gonna post a little message onto that message forum, um, inviting folks to say hi and talk about their experiences with you know, gas misconceptions. Um, so you can, you're welcome to, to tag to that thread. Um, in addition, we're gonna post the replay on the network um, and send it around, so look for that. Um, you'll have a brief feedback survey that comes after the call. Um, we always love to hear feedback, especially about the um, uh, the event and about the breakout room introductions. And finally, if y'all are interested in putting on a webinar and want to work with Halt the Harm to do one, um, we're always available too, so get in touch with us. But I want to say thank you again to Caleb. That was a great uh, presentation, really informative, really helpful. This recording is going to be super useful. Um, I'm excited to share it with folks afterwards. So um, thanks everyone again. Have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for taking time to join us. And thank you, Caleb. I'll see you all later.